Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us once again. And once again, The Real News is going to be talking with Wendell Potter. You all know him from all of our work with him before. Uh, he worked with Humana for many years, was inside the corporate world, and then he had a change of heart and wrote these books, and books like Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider speaks out on how corporate PR is killing healthcare and deceiving Americans, and Nation on the Take, how big money corrupts our democracy, and what we can do about it. His newest project is tarbell.org, which examines the money and politics, and it affects millions and millions of Americans. And it's good to have a chance to talk with you here, Wendell. Thanks, Mark. It's good to be here. So um, let me just take, go take a step backward to, the, to your days at Humana and your days in the corporate world. And, I'm, and I, we've, I know you've been interviewed about your change of heart and how that, you know, what you've come to. But I'm curious as you think about your life in the corporate world and what America faces now, money and politics, how do you think America gets over this bridge, gets over this hump of money and politics since you were smack dab in the middle of it? I think we've got to somehow curb the influence of money and politics. Uh, uh, I did work at, at Humana and Cigna. And when I was at Cigna, one of the things that I my staff did was uh, control uh, the political action committee giving. And we doled out money to, to candidates that we liked. And we also, I, was, I worked very closely with our lobbyists. So I learned uh, how corporations spend money to influence public opinion and public policy and elections. And it's one of the reasons I left my job was because I knew that we were, uh, in many cases, drifting away from our roots as a republic into one that was controlled largely by corporations and by the, 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 the wealthiest in this country. Um, it's one of the reasons I left, because I felt that I needed to, to tell what I learned and what I knew and what I used to do in my old job to have people understand just where we are as a country and what we need to do about it. So what, the reason I wrote Nation on the Take, to help people wake up to the reality of the fact that uh, in many cases our democracy is just a, a democracy in name only. So on a personal level, when, when the years you worked at Cigna and, and Humana, um, the people you work with, did you all ever have conversations about what exactly you were doing? Having a sense that you, know, that you were influencing power, what that meant and why? Did those discussions take place? Any questions? I mean, I've always been very curious about what the inner workings were like. You no, know, that you, you don't have those conversations. You just become part of a team. And there's that men mentality. You, you're working for an organization and there's this team mentality. And you are expected to be a team player and to do your, your part, play your role, to help the, the company achieves, achieve its objectives. And typically that objective, the overall objective, is to enhance shareholder value, is to reward uh, people who are already very rich and who are investing mm -hmm. in your country who, and company and who own it. Um, so that's why I, I, I learned that we have increasingly a plutocracy in this, this country. But when you're on the inside, you become very much, I think, unaware of, uh, of how the rest of the country really lives and also the consequences of the actions. You, you might have some small part, and typically you do if you work for a big corporation, you have some small part. Few people are able to pull back and see the forest for the trees. Uh, uh, they're just completely self-focused. They are usually paid very well. Uh, get bonuses and right. and stock options and and your ability to uh, help the team meet its objectives uh, determine whether or not you're going to get that bonus and, and stock option. To me, it makes me think of this is <clears throat> people look at this in many ways. This is just how America is built. This is what we do in America. This is how the system works. So whether you're functioning inside the system and that's your job and that's how you view it because that's your job, or on the outside, kind of giving up saying. This is just the way it is. I mean, why beat your head against the wall? That's what America's about. It's what it's about, but we've had such a, a growth in the power of corporations, far more than it was when I was growing up. Uh, and executive compensation is far, far higher than it ever was in, in the early parts of this, you know, early, early beginnings of this country. Um, it's more like what we had during the Gilded Age of the early 1900s. We're kind of in a second gilded age right. in which uh, the rich and powerful uh, are, are much more influential than, than they have been in the past. So but we've seen course corrections in, in our country's history as we saw then. Um, this nonprofit organization that I, uh, I started, Tarbell.org, Tarbell. mm -hmm. uh, is named after Ida Tarbell, who was a muckraking journalist of the early 1900s during that Gilded Age. Right. And she set her sights on, at the time, the richest man in the world, John D. Rockefeller. 
and his big monopoly, the Standard Oil Company. And her reporting was so impactful that it led to the breakup of that company and to some very important antitrust and campaign finance laws. We're at a similar point in history in which we've seen once again corporations amass tremendous power and people beginning to wake up to realize the consequences of that. Uh, there's a lot of support uh, throughout the country for doing something to curb that power at both the, the, the state and municipal level, not, and, and increasingly so at the federal level. So one of the <clears> things that seemed to change that dynamic in the early part of the 19th century, I was thinking of, well, I actually the first thought of was thinking about Dwight G. Eisenhower, what he warned us about as he was leaving right, office. Exactly. Right, exactly. The corporate military power and the, the complex. Right. And he wouldn't even recognize where we are he right would now. Not. Um, yeah. You know, as the president of my childhood, he, right. he, he would not remember. And mine too. Um, but one of the things that seemed to change this was there was the, the, the growth of the union movement. That was mm -hmm. part of the push because right. labor kind of stood up and said, we have demand our rights. And there was this push to end the Gilded Age. And, the, and, it, be, and it was much easier in some senses to seem to organize that in the teens, 20s and 30s than it is now because yeah. it's such a disparate, it seems to me, and yeah. an almost Wild West atmosphere in terms of, of how Amazon and, and the rest of those companies work. That, that's true. So I think you'll have a different dynamic or a different set of circumstances that will be at play to curb this power once again. I don't think that, I think the labor unions can play a role, but they're not as vigorous as they once were, right. for sure. <clears throat> uh, you're seeing, I think, uh, in, I live in Philadelphia and there are, uh, there's a group uh, called Philadelphia 3.0 in Philadelphia that is really focused on trying to uh, root out corruption in, in, in local Philadelphia politics, which over the decades has been very corrupt. Uh, and they're, they're, they're recruiting candidates here. They're figuring out how to get uh, people more engaged in local elections. And they're having some measure of success. Uh, and other, other cities are looking to do uh, something comparable or are looking at how they can change campaign finance at the local or state level. So we're, I, I, in other words, I think that you're seeing change uh, happen, but it's, uh, it's taking a different form in the 21st century. And you have people like, we <clears throat> talked about earlier before we got on camera together, people like Congressman John Sarbanes from here in Maryland with, with his HR1, really going after money and politics yeah. and trying to change the entire dynamic and make certain things illegal. Right. I mean, that's in some ways what you might have to do to create a different kind of conversation yeah. in America is it grabs hold of, of people who actually in many ways don't really think things can change. That's part of the problem. They do. There is this uh, feeling of uh, helplessness right. or just that the right. system is the way it is and nothing is going to change. And you're, you're always going to have that. But you also are going to have uh, maybe starting with a small core group of people who are saying, well, this is not working anymore and this is taking us far, far from where we need to be and certainly far from uh, what the founding fathers would have uh, uh, or founders would have ever envisioned and even what Dwight Eisenhower would have envisioned. Um, so I think you're seeing more activism. Uh, just a few weeks ago, for example, I spoke at a conference in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it was called the Unrig Summit. And people from all over the country came together and their, the sole purpose of coming together was in various ways to combat uh, the influence, the growing influence of corporate power and the influence of special interest on our politics. So as someone who spent all these years inside the in corporate world and now kind of, in a sense, battling that world that you were in, trying to reform what we see in our country, how do you sit on the line here? Pessimist? Optimist? Do you think that it, this can change? How do you see that process yeah, actually happening? It, it depends on the on the, on the day and on, on <laughs> and what the time of the day. day and, and, <laughs> the time of the day. But overall, I'm an optimist, and uh -huh. uh, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was to uh, to help people wake up to the reality of 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 how big corporations and special interests control our lives in ways that uh, we're usually oblivious to. And it's why I started again, Tarbell. We we. You need to help educate people uh, so that people can understand the consequences of what is happening and, and the rising power of corporations and special interests, how our daily lives are affected. But people need to know uh, what they can do about it. And uh, at Tarbell and in the talks that I give, people are always asking me, well, what can I do? And what do you say to them? I said, well, first of all, uh, become, watch, you know, pay attention to the news, uh, pay attention to your local politics, vote, become informed voters, 
but join organizations uh, that are involved in one way or another in curbing uh, uh, corporate power. It could be an organization like Represent Us, which is a national organization, but they have local chapters. Uh, uh, seek out those organizations that are uh, trying to do something about this, or just become more civically engaged on something that might be of specific interest to you, like uh, healthcare or the climate or whatever it might be, uh, or some local issue. Get involved. Uh, don't be a, a pessimist yourself. Don't be uh, someone who's just resigned that this is the way things always always will be. It will it will be that way unless we have more people who are engaged. But there are I'm seeing signs all over the country of people becoming more engaged, more civically involved, and uh, that's what gives me hope and makes me an optimist. That's a good thing. We could use a bit more of that in our country right. at the moment. A little more optimism <clears throat> would not hurt us, I think, in exactly. our struggle to make this a better yeah. place. Because, you know, you, you, you think about this and you think about people thinking about Citizens United and what's happening in the courts when it comes to corporate power and corporations being seen as, as, as persons right. and the way we look at them legally and the battle around that and the increasing shift towards the right in our court system, which could lead people, could lead people to some pessimism here around this. Yeah. And then you've got the battles on the other side, but as I, we talked about the HR1 and the groups you're talking about around the country in different cities that are actually trying to build something different. And yeah. so it seems to me it's going to take a massive struggle to change that. It's going to be any, any, anything that's important. Uh, and when you have some uh, entrenched opposition, it's a fight. It's a struggle. And, and certainly those who have power don't want to give that power up. Uh, but it can't happen, as we've seen historically in this country and uh, over, over time in, in, in world civilization. Uh, we, we've seen that, that uh, tyrants can be overcome and uh, uh, that change can happen uh, in, in a positive way. I think the arc of history is, is one that uh, gives me some in encouragement as well, too. We, you and Martin Luther King. Me, exactly. <laughs> uh, that, 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 uh, uh, it, it seems like progress can be very slow. Uh, and we have to consider this, I think, to a certain extent as a marathon rather than a sprint. We're not going to overturn Citizens United tomorrow. It's going to take a while. Right. But votes count, and people, I hope, will, um, organizations like the ones that we just talked about, can uh, encourage people to, under, uh, to, to get out and vote. That's the, the, the most important thing I think we can do. And we've seen uh, those other candidates winning, taking on kind of the corporate elite and actually winning with small donors as, as, as emblematic of what actually could change. Which is extraordinarily exciting. You're seeing candidates who are amassing a lot of uh, uh, campaign money uh, through very small uh, right. campaign donations. And you're, you're seeing uh, in, in increasingly cities taking action to uh, increase the power of, of individual donors. In New York City, for example, they have, uh, uh, they have uh, f uh, passed some years ago campaign finance reform that empowers small donors. Someone in New York who uh, uh, can give $10 to a, a candidate uh, can find his or her uh, contribution matched uh, to be the equivalent of $90. Uh, and uh, candidates no longer have to go just to uh, the rich and powerful in New York. They can now get quite a lot of campaign money from donors who can't afford more than 10 bucks. So that's changing uh, the dynamics of, uh, of the electorate and who represents the electorate. So Baltimore and other parts of our nation wake up. It can happen in your backyard as well. It absolutely can. It's great to be able to kind of uh, wind down my day with a more optimistic view of where we might go, Wendell. Thanks so much. <laughs> Mark, thank you. I really mean it. Thank you. Thank you. So we've been here with Wendell Potter and I'm Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to come back with Wendell at some point soon and really probe this much deeper. Thank you. Take care.